In conjunction with the resurgence of the artificial neural network research tradition in the 1980s, uh, brought about in part by those um, theoretical advances that I mentioned uh, in the previous lecture, uh, there emerged as well an alternative paradigm for thinking about human cognition, built now not on the earlier computationalist paradigm, but now on what was sometimes called parallel distributed processing paradigms or connectionist paradigms. Okay, so thinking about human cognition in terms of uh, it being the type of thing that can be modeled with an artificial neural network rather than the type of thing that would be modeled in the more top-down, functional, uh, you know, functionally distinguished modules, each uh, performing their functions uh, mode of, of modeling that characterized computationalism. Okay. So what I want to do just briefly, and, and this is very much not complete, I'm just trying to uh, point to some of the the things that were mentioned in this debate as reasons to favor computationalism or connectionism. Because as co as connectionism came on the scene, uh, a number of people were skeptical and argued against it and argued in favor of the earlier computationalist paradigm. And it's still something of an open question of how much of human cognition you know is better explained in one way or in the other way. Um, so. If I may, I'll just briefly talk through some of the strengths and weaknesses of the two approaches. So some of the strengths of computationalism are that it does seem that computational models, because they're usually thinking of uh, cognitive processes as manipulating symbols or token representations or some some other kind of um, informational uh informational element like that that they have a parallel with language and reasoning and a large part of human cognition at least a large part of of the human cognition that we can access that we're familiar with that seems um that comes to mind when we think about what does a mind do and how does it operate um, involves language and reasoning and so these computational models were like, were like uh, earlier models of language and reasoning, like models in linguistics or in uh, in logic, uh, in this in this way that they had distinguishable, discrete tokens that were interacting with each other according to rules, um, and that this was the way that that cognition was being modeled. Another strength is that they explain mental phenomena by their functions. So, you know, one of the first steps of a computationalist procedure would be to ask, well, like, what is the function of, of memory? Like, what, what are the inputs coming in? What are the outputs going out? And what does memory do in terms of inputs, processing, and outputs? Um, what counts as a solution for a memory program? What counts as success? These kinds of questions were, were really, would really guide researchers and computationalists um, in the computationalist paradigm. And you can see how that jives well with uh, evolutionary approaches, why it, um, it, it, it syncs well also with kind of common sense understandings of our um, cognitive uh, systems because you know language is for communication, language is for reasoning, right? The various parts of our cognition are very plausibly for something. And so to understand how they work, it makes sense to first model them in terms of like what they do, what they're for. Um, and then and then get into the details of the mechanics that enable them to do that. Another feature of computationalist models that is attractive is that they are relatively understandable in terms of how they work. Um, there was a sort of sense among computationalist researchers that if you couldn't uh, write a program that anybody who understands how to read programs could look at and 
and understand what it was doing, then you hadn't really effectively modeled that part of human cognition because you know if you don't understand what the program's doing then the program isn't teaching you anything about human cognition um, so in a way sort of the whole point of of writing these programs was to be able to have an understandable statement of how a certain process works whereas with connectionist models one of the things that was noticed about them relatively early on is that sometimes they might solve problems and something about their inner architecture if we could you know study it study how the weights had been distributed for instance in a neural network we might we might learn something about uh you know how the system is solving the problems that it's solving but in some cases we might just be at a loss to say why this system works or why it works in the way that it does or as well as it does so understandability is much less on the surface with um, with connectionist models than it is with computational models computational models also generally take the different major functional processes of cognition to be modular that is that they're you know each one can be carried out individually from the others it might rely on some data or be informed by data or communication with the others but that we could for instance understand uh, memory independently of understanding reasoning and uh, there there also is a sense that inside each of these processes if there are discrete tokens something like um, symbols in a symbol system that are undergoing transformations you know each of those parts of one or another of these subsystems is itself modular and distinct from other parts and so that modularity contributes to the understandability and it also seems to match some in some kind of common sense ideas about how our reasoning and our language work for instance the sense that our language is built up out of words you know sentences are made of words paragraphs are made of sentences and so there's a way of breaking up the larger parts into smaller parts each of which is discrete and is related to the other parts in some kind of regular or rule-like way um, and all of that uh, contributes to understandability all of that uh, seems to seems fairly to describe a lot of what our cognition is like um, relatedly a lot of those symbols that make up those systems are representational and in other words they're about something they seem to have a semantics and uh, it was relatively easy to see how on on sort of the analogy of of cognitive systems with linguistic systems in particular like you know sentences <laughs> um, on that analogy it seemed relatively easy to understand how parts of cognition could be representational could have a semantics because if there actually is a kind of concept token that's operative in my cognition like a token that represents trees or is about trees um, then when I think trees are green or trees are usually green uh, then that token is playing the same kind of role in my thinking as it plays in the sentence trees are usually green and since the word in the sentence has a referent trees since it can refer or be representational it's not too hard to understand how a token um, some kind of again like symbol in my cognition which could be you know a concept or an idea how that could also refer to things like trees and with connectionist networks they seem to certainly not be as modular because there's a more fluid way in which input of different types can affect the decision making at the output stage that is you know how something is classified it, it seems to be more what we might call associative or probabilistic than it is logical um, it's fuzzier it's less uh, deterministic it's less um, you know it's it's more like um, mixing colors than it is like putting together Lego blocks and so it's less modular um, and that uh, to some critics of connectionism suggested that 
connectionism can't be the right account for things like human reasoning. Um, on the other hand, connectionists would often point out that, hey, a lot of aspects of human cognition are probably fuzzier like that. They're not, they are more probabilistic and they are less, um, they're less deterministic and modular. Likewise about representation, uh, there was, so this, on, on, the, on the topic of representation, some people thought connectionism, it's very hard to understand how the uh, connections in a network can constitute representations of anything. But others thought that the way that networks are trained and how they in, incremental, they get incremental improvements in their response to uh, stimuli or to inputs and that they become able to classify or differentiate um, with uh, increasing levels of accuracy that that alone suggested that they were actually they were actually building representations from the ground up whereas in the case of computational systems even if we say that some part of the system represents um, we if we haven't shown how that connection between inputs and representation becomes forged, um, then we haven't really explained representations. So the question of which account was better as far as representations go uh, was, was a, was a uh, comp more complicated debate than some of these others. There were reasons given on either side of it. There were also connectionists who who criticized computationalism for being too attached to the idea that that mental states and processes represent at all. So there were kind of anti-representationalist connectionists who thought we shouldn't really think about cognition as fundamentally about representations. That representation, that whole idea of representation might be a bit of a of a myth in terms of how we think about what we're what we're how our cognition works and how we are related to the world. One of the major strengths of connectionism, of course, is its evident parallel with the structure of the brain, at least some aspects of the brain. Um, ever since Rosenblatt, artificial neural network researchers have been inspired by biological brains and, and how, um, how they're put together, you know, the basic idea of a biological neural network. So this is a major argument in support of it, a, a reason to think that a connectionist um, approach would do a good job or, or a better, relatively better job of modeling the brain than a computationalist one, M modeling the mind, I should say, than a computationalist one. Um, another benefit of connectionism is that it seems to match a phenomenon of, of the relation between human brains and human cognitive performance, which is called graceful degradation. Basically that if there's damage to a few neurons in a network, either artificial or biological, that generally doesn't greatly impede the success of the network. That there's a kind of robustness in networks um, that, that allows them to continue to perform about as well as they did before. Because if you have a thousand neurons, for instance, in a network and you lose five of them, it's unlikely to disrupt the functioning of the whole network uh, catastrophically. Whereas uh, computational systems, they would degrade catastrophically rather than gracefully. I mean, if you leave out, say, two lines of code in a program that's supposed to run search trees and use heuristics to solve a problem, leaving out those two lines, those might actually be crucial restrictions on allowable transformations of your symbol structures. And that would actually lead to, you know, false results, uh, you know, misleading results, um, or possibly those are essential to the code working at all. And so maybe the, you know, the code will just break and you won't get a result. And that doesn't seem to well match the way human cognition works. Um, on the other hand, of course, you can argue that there are some thinking processes that will only be successful if, if certain steps are taken. And so if, if a thinking process is of that type, then maybe computationalism will be a better model for it. Think, for instance, about uh, developing a mathematical proof. Uh, it does seem like leaving out a few steps of a mathematical proof might 
degrade the proof catastrophically. <laughs> um, and so that might be hard to model with a connectionist network for the same reason that connectionist networks are good for modeling other kinds of human uh, reasoning and cognition. 